Welcome to the final episode of Agitators Anonymous for this season, episode 12. If it makes any difference, it's the last one. We'll start again next week. So this is a video interview with Adi from Solstafir. It's about sobriety. It's about mental health issues. It's about depression. It's very interesting, and it tells his journey through all of those things. Um, he's a good friend, and it was very gracious of him to do the interview. So without further ado, please like, subscribe, share, follow me on Instagram, blah de blah de blah Here you go, Adi from Solstafir. Then again, well, let me show you something. See. This got more comments in the last video. Okay. Oh, you is this for real? Yeah, they're blue filter glasses. This got more comments in the last video than anything I said about politics. Sweet <laughs> Lord. I know. Are those, uh, do you use them for reading? No, not for reading. I have other ones for reading, but you can't see them. <laughs> uh, they're, like blue, they're blue filter. They um, stop the filter of the screen hurts your eyes if you've got to be. Oh. It's this new remote living future where we're all going to have to sit in front of a screen for 16 hours a day. So my poor eyes are... Not the best. Well, I work, I, work, I work with a hammer, so. You work with a hammer? Yes. And does that mean the new album is more heavy metal or more like Hammerfall? <laughs> more like Man of War. <laughs> no. Well, you know, Solstever and Primordial have a connection with a certain hammer. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'm not sure we can discuss that story. No, that's not, that's not, no. I have that hammer, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, some someday we will, it'll have to be returned to its rightful owner. Yes, of course, the return of the hammer. Yeah, there you go. So, how's it been going during this enforced um, lockdown period? It's very strange well, to not be playing festivals for the first time in twenty years, isn't it? Sure, but we sort of came prepared. Uh, we, uh, I was going to have a child in April. Mm. Hartgrimur was going to have a kid in June. So therefore, we sort of had not planned our summer like, you know, killing ourselves with doing two to three festivals every weekend. Yeah. Which, which is the norm. So therefore, we sort of, we had like three, four, four or five festivals the whole of summer. Mm. So it was a very mild planning mm. for us. So... And we were in the studio in February, so yeah. so we ha we didn't have much book, so we could we could be in the studio during the the the, the maximum social distancing of the COVID shit. So we were just in the studio, either you know the band or we, uh, you know one by one or whatever, and then just very slow process of uh, post production, you know, emailing so. <clears throat> It was, it was kind of, it wasn't that bad. Right. Um, I suppose so, on those circumstances, you had some other distractions impending or something like this, you know? I think the whole experience really, I mean, it seems to vary vastly from person to person. There are people within the same, within Promoted, within the same band who have hated it and loved it to varying degrees. I'd say love is a strong phrase, but I think by now everyone is it's wearing very, very thin, you know? But it, it, of course it was a bit weird. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was having, uh, she was about, to, you know, I was not allowed to be, I was not supposed to be allowed to, the presence of my child being born. And was very post-apocalyptic, you know, with a mask and gloves yeah. coming, <clears throat> coming in touch, touch with a pregnant woman. And, you know, no one knew anything. And so it was very weird stuff. But, yeah. you know, it, it turned out good. Uh, everybody just, you know, was careful. Uh, I mean, you know, my, my sister got sick. Her three right. kids, everyone. It was weird. But, uh, you know, it's kind of weird. But, you know... <clears throat> And yeah, I mean, for me, it's been very, very strange. It's the first time in years and years. And it's like some sort of potential future just got moved really, really like, I keep using the word expedited, but just got moved super close. And I just got this very profound 
view into, oh, this is what it's like to have no band, um, to, especially when you've lived your whole last 25 more yeah, yeah. in and around music, and then it's just gone. And it's like having no uh, purpose, which is very- Of course, I mean, uh, I, mean, I mean, guys like us, we've been in the same band since we were like 18. And now we're grown men. So it's just a kind of weird that stopping that, of course. It's really mm. weird, especially since, I mean, for us, it's 2020 now. The last eight years, we've been, you know, touring, 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 touring more. Yeah. And now we're so used to, you know, every year you do, I don't know. I mean, the most we've done was 200 shows a year. Mm. Uh, the, the summers have been crazy. So now it's like, what are you going to do? I mean, <clears throat> think, thankfully, we're still, we still, we just finished the album and we have sort of, <clears throat> we have to learn the songs, we can do some stuff, but I, I, I'm kind of worried about how next year is going to be because yeah. everybody knew this summer was going to be off. Yeah. Sure. Let's just, we'll just skip <clears throat> one summer. We don't know. It's gonna be oh. Okay. Someone is calling. Someone is calling me here. Well, I, I mean, I've been pretty, you know, I've been um, trying to sort of wax lyrical about it and deal with it as it comes. And I mean, the pro, the biggest, w one of the most pessimistic thoughts I have, and something I've been thinking about a lot, I suppose, because I've been pretty down about the situation, but is that if we do get something like some sort of second spike, we can forget not just this year, but I think next year as regards touring and, and packing and you know venues of three four five or up to 800 with all those people in it they're going to demand socially distanced gigs which means no gigs and no touring and one more summer off for the festivals and i think most of them will disappear and the big problem what i'm trying to get my head around is that is this a pivotal moment in musical history where the old idea of rock and roll is going to literally in two years 18 months two years die off venues and bars are going to close agents are going to disappear this is what in my darkest sort of view of yeah okay history. okay it's a very it's a very pessimistic dark view but it's sure it's maybe it, 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 there's a reason to think that way i don't want to I, I don't want to go there in my head mm. but you're absolutely, you're absolutely right it could be uh, i mean even restaurants cafes everything dies because there's no money coming in well but sure. if you the festivals might not survive it. Mm. Sure, what can, we, what can we all, but... Well, I mean, I think that the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's but specifically just, let's be uh, to what rock and roll or what we knew as rock and roll. And that I think comedy and theater can survive in distant seated places, maybe not packed yeah. in, but for gigs as we knew it, let's say if yeah. a, gig, a thousand capacity venue can only have 15 capacity percent capacity, you can't really have a socially distanced gig as we knew. No, 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 no. And because I personally don't think that young people, like teenagers, I don't think young people could really give a shit about like live music as generations before did. I, I'm just really sort of pessimistically worried that we might be passing into some phase where what we are it, it, is, over. You mean that it's almost basically over? Yeah, that it's that it will be kind of done because I th I have a feeling if there's a second surge, um, the way society is now, there's no way that most governments will allow people to accept risk, um, and make well, their own risk. Well, 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 well. On that subject, the funniest thing, of course, you know, I'm gonna go off topic here. Okay. The funniest thing is, of course, is the last Trump rally, because they, mm. like a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours, said on the internet. You, if you can't have concerts, you can yeah. just have rallies. Uh, apparently, they can have rallies in America, yeah. but not yeah. concerts. Or protests. But, and then again, thankfully, people buy albums still, right? Think what? Thankfully, people buy albums, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, we have all our streaming money, too. Well, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. in reality, it's not the money so much. I mean, the money is difficult to... Um, compensate with but it's actually for me what I found profoundly disorientating is the uh, it's the sense of purpose that's gone but also the sense of adventure of travel of of the other yeah, that it's I'm just literally living on the same couple of streets running on the same streets and you th you're thinking to yourself okay if this is 
I suppose, like I said, in the, in the sort of darker moments, I've been thinking like, oh, this is the end of that thing that we knew um, to be touring. Because if there's a socially distanced gig model and it's enforced for two years, I, I have a feeling that might sort of kill people's connection to people have this nostalgic view of how they view of rock and roll, but I th I personally think young people don't really give a shit, and I think that. But okay, but, but what do you think is the average of people that's going to the summer festivals? You know, the full force rock and hell fest. What do you think the average age is? 18, 25? Maybe mid twenties, late twenties. Yeah, twenty-seven. Twenty-five. 20, yeah. You think those people are not gonna go to Hellfest in twenty twenty-three if it's gonna be no Hellfest for three years? But the thing is, I don't think Hellfest could survive the financial repercussions to still be around. But I mean, the, the thing that, for example, if, if your local bar or venue, your local rock or metal bar has to go under because it's hemorrhaged money for the last six months, um, then there's no hub. There's no social hub. And because I think this rock and metal is so stuck in 1976's model, i.e. touring is the artery then once you sever that i'm pretty i'm sort of worried that because i i said it flippantly but i mean it that like if i'm just going to be this screen here in front of you singing and that's my gig uh, i won't make any more heavy metal and, no and of course not i won't do it i mean no no of, of course not but but i it's 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 impossible to for, foresee mm. uh like everybody saying no one has seen time seen times like this no. No, uh, you know, we, we can't foresee it, man. But, have, uh, you, but have, you, have you found that the, I kind of wondered about the way, like, because what music employs or enter arts or entertainment or culture or whatever, everything from the barmen to the bar staff to the lighting technicians to the crew to the, it's so many, mm -hmm. it's so many, many people that I found yeah. virtually no stories in the mainstream media sort of dealing with it on a serious level. They've all been, oh, look what crazy musicians are doing a cooking course and stuff. It seems to be the repercussions of having all of your art and entertainment as a moved online is um, not really being discussed, you know? Sorry yeah. to depress you after your day's work and hiking, you know? No, 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 no. <laughs> but the thing is, some bands are actually playing in Iceland. And I thought that, well, me, be, me being optimistic about it, because we've neglected Iceland for years. Sure. I just thought, I just thought, well, I guess we'll just do shows in Iceland for the next year or two. Yeah. That bands are actually doing it. Yeah. But, but then again, then again, coming back to the original thing, we have opened the country now. Sure. And they are scanning every single person at the airport. And, you know, this, they are, you know, getting new cases at the airport every day. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, there's, and no there, way, there's, there's always, no way to stop that. No, but then again, there's always the question, did we open too soon? Because before they opened, it was, it was almost like it didn't happen. They were, one of the first people to arrive in the country now was a, a CNN reporter. Right, okay. He was here. Uh, it's an interesting thing. And his, his conclusion was, it's almost like COVID didn't happen in Iceland. Yeah, because same in New Zealand, in a, same in yeah. whatever. Yeah, so if we just would have kept the country closed, everybody was like, oh, it's, you know, it's like the, like the damn war. It rained over Europe, it was terrible in Europe and uh, in the world. But over here it's like, we're so isolated, just, you know, you couldn't really feel it. Yeah, So I uh, mean, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> We talked about this um, before, but it's the, for me, it's something a bit more, it's a bit more uh, profound than, and I've been trying to say this on this other podcast I was doing, that it's the sense of, um, you know, if you've been away for a weekend of playing gigs, now we never toured the last few years as extensive as you, but we still did 30, 40, sometimes a bit more gigs every year and summer festivals, but it's the sense of um, achievement, purpose, yeah. Uh, and focus or something, you know, which I found very, very hard to deal with not having any of those things in a sense that like for people maybe who just milled around at home and are home birds and just lived where they worked and had a couple of streets. I mean, it sounds like I'm whinging and complaining, but um, I think for human beings, um, just as human monkeys hurtling into space, 
um, having a sense of purpose is so incredibly important, you know, for your mental yeah, health I, at least, you know. I agree, but the thing is, I've had times in my life when Solstavi was the only <laughs> thing I did. Yeah. I would go tour, home, live with money, owe debt, you know, get debt, go touring, get a little bit of money, pay bills, get jobs in between tours. Sure, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, there's nothing... Uh, Nothing booked for Solstavir through the year. Uh, uh, maybe one gig in Iceland in uh, end of the year. But anyway, I have a job. Mm. I show up to my job at 7 in the morning. I come home at 5. Take a shower. I go meet my uh, nine-week-old daughter. Mm -hmm. And I go home and back to sleep. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a bit of a change from... Live and breathe soul stuff and tour life sure, yeah, 24 yeah. 7 for a few months, for a few years. Into I don't have to do a new album with the guys for the next three years. Sure, yeah. Just finished an album. So I don't have to write new songs for the band for the next three years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, touring, sure. I cannot control it. I, no matter what I do, I cannot control it. I just have to wait. I hate being I'm not a patient guy I hate patience uh, so until next year why are you laughing at me no no <laughs> so I cannot control it only thing that you know I have a little bit of purpose now well like not little yeah bit of course that's what I mean now. yeah yeah you have a purpose yeah but so yeah. so, but, but it would be different if I didn't have the kid yeah for uh, sure I wouldn't I wouldn't have gotten this job so I can pay my bills and I would just imagine mm. this we are doing the uh, maximum amount of 200 shows a year. Mm. COVID hits. I would be like, fucking hell, man. Fuck. Yeah. But like I said, it's, I think it's going to be fine later on, even though, like you say, the rock and roll, touring world, as we know, it's probably going to be different. It is. I don't think it's going to disappear. I'm, I'm, I'm going to refuse to believe that. Yeah. If Hellfest and Wacken die next year, all the you know all the festivals, I'm sure that in 2023, 2026, a new festival will come up. Sure, I'm it's, sure. It's, it's I'm more people. Yeah, it's more the bar club, people packed into a small um, venue or like a four to eight hundred venue that I'm more talking about because I think that most local agents and venues are going to renegotiate. So that everything is a door deal. So that mo I don't know if you saw the Live Nation new yeah new demo and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this yeah, is yeah. like this. This shit is going to run downhill, and I think that we're all going to have every venue asking us for merch and this, that, and the other if it happens. But if it's socially distant in venues, then you're only going to get huge bands who can charge 250 euro a ticket for 150 capacity in a thousand venue or something or 800 venue. It's there's no okay. financial way for it to work. That's yeah. Uh... It, it's weird, you know, it's weird how people don't buy music, it's free streaming, everything is free. We have a new generation coming up that uh, music is free. Yeah. Do you know, I'm just going to ask you, the price for seeing Soul Stavro Primordial uh, in a gig in Germany, uh, how much is it, 25? Yeah, maybe, maybe, no, maybe... 23, 26. How much do you think it was five years ago, 10 years ago? Same, similar. Is, it, is, it, uh, is the price going up for guys like me and you? Or is it staying the same? Uh, well, the, what do you mean? The price of our cost of our living or? No, no, the price of the tickets to see the band. Um, because I know the, no. the, 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 big, the big bands seem to be skyrocketing the prices. Yeah, I mean, it's the big bands who are going to, if they want to save the middle bands like ourselves, have to take huge cuts from charging festivals, 150,000 and 200,000 euro and all this kind of crazy shit. Yeah. You know? I mean, it yeah. shows, it, but it does go to show you that after 25 or 30 years of being in the industry, actually having, you know, videos with X amount of streams, however many f monthly listeners, 60, 80, 90,000, that there you are working a nine to five job with a fucking breaking shit with a hammer. Um, to try and pay the rent. It sort of puts streaming in a very clear 
perspective to understand for anybody who doesn't really understand that Solstafir is a big fucking band and there you are breaking rocks with a hammer to pay the rent. It's not, it's if, not if, a big But imagine, friend. well, I'm being facetious, but like you're still, that's what you're doing. You're not able to do a thing with, no, 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 no. you can't pay the rent from streaming, you know? No, 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 no. no. I mean, that's, I mean, I mean, we, we spoke about this back in the day. I mean, we were having, since, since you were like a rain man, uh, we, we were talking about this. Uh, how was it? If you sold, if the, uh, let's just say the last Primordial, what's the highest selling Primordial album? I, uh, I don't know. I suppose to the name is dead or retribute redemption. Yeah. I kind of stopped let's, paying attention really. What's the better, let's just say to the nameless dad, if that came out in 1990, yeah, how much do you think you would have sold? I mean, comparatively, half a yeah. million, half a million, maybe. Half, yeah, that, that, this is the conversation we're having. So, having half a million or 300, selling half, three, yeah, selling half, half, yeah, selling, selling a half a million albums, it would be amazing today. It would be, yeah, it would make you one of the top couple of artists in the world nobody half a million physical sales yeah i don't think no one does that really you know no but you know it's uh yeah i don't know it's it's all going down the drain it, it's funny that uh did i tell you that uh we went to the spotify offices yeah you didn't go with a uh, no i can't say that <laughs> what was that like we uh we well we went there sort of part of the showcase gig with Icelandic sort of introducing Icelandic products. I mean, it was Icelandic liquor and food, and we were so part of uh, the the Ministry of Cultural Funds or whatever. You should have brought anyway rotting shark meat and left it in their fucking offices. Yes. So 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 we go there, and it's in Lower Manhattan, and it's in World Trade Center building number three. Yeah. So some fancy building and we go to floor number 75 uh, so we're on top floor and there's 360 view of the office all over lower Manhattan all right. I'm like fucking hell it's amazing and she said yeah we, we own the top 15 floors yeah so Spotify and they, say, and, they say they don't, and they say they don't make any money yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, it's, you know, and I, I mean, I, I asked her, I told her, well, as, as an artist, I fucking hate this, mm. this product. As a fan, yeah, I amazing. bloody love it. I, I bloody love it. Yeah. And I asked her one question is that, do you think it's realistic for a small band like us to be able to live on streaming? I mean, Instead of selling albums, yeah. and she said, "Yes, yes, of course it is. Lots of bands, smaller bands, are living on it." Well, I didn't believe her. I don't believe her, but she no. was confident. Yeah. Wait, do you think that's kind of like? It's kind of like is she a you know like a a person, a North Korean uh, you know public speaker or something like this? You know, in, indoctrinated by the government yeah. into towing the party line. You know. I, I just didn't believe her. It was kind of, no. all, I put myself in an awkward situation, but yeah. Well, we know it's not true. <laughs> I yeah. mean, we're the living proof that it isn't true. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, but have you found any, like, um, we all often talk about this kind of thing, but with the parameters changing and moving, have you found any, how can we say, I found it, bit difficult coping with some of the mental kind of health issues of having that um, uh, purpose taken away you know and so trying to replace that with something I found quite difficult whereas you were in a position there where you've uh, started a family which seems like a quite a a good response to the <laughs> to the to that potential problem do you know what I mean does that make any sense no, Sorry, I'm not really asking you. I'm not really asking you a question there. I'm more telling you something about me, I suppose. But well, to, to, I, I lost the concentration as my, <laughs> my mate came here. <laughs> um, no, I was just trying to open up a small conversation, just a bit about mental health and that kind of stuff, because we often talked about that before, and how many yeah. musicians or people within this 
industry and around it must be struggling with this sense of purpose. That's what I've been trying to dig down to, into this week, you know. I think people are just drinking more, aren't they? Yeah, a lot of people are hitting the booze. Um, or I've been yeah. running, I've been running every day, but it's, it's, it has no, again, it's a solitary uh, thing. It has no, doesn't bring me any joy at all. Well, you but I, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, of course, I mean, I know you. I mean, you live, live in this. I mean, you, you do booking for other bands. You have two bands yourself. You work for a record label. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, all this. I mean, you know, you know, hey, anyway. Well, not so, you know, this, <laughs> I I, no, Exactly. I mean, this, I have no work I mean, you, you, Yeah, so I know that. that you, this is, you haven't had a nine-to-five job. You don't have kids. Mm. You're very unlucky, unlucky with the ladies. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so, so I know what you mean. So it's very easy to just go down. I'm gonna, just gonna be drunk. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it, like I said, it takes away what you're good at, what you live for. You know, yeah. music, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, obviously, I don't drink anymore, so I, yeah, I don't yeah. do that. But, but I've been <sighs> these days. Is I go to work. Uh, uh, it's it's tough. Uh, but it's work. Yeah. Uh, I tried. I tried to go outdoors like today. Uh, I went hiking. Yeah. I walked on top of a mountain. It was yeah. bloody amazing. So yeah. uh, I, I try to be more outdoors. Uh, you know, I've been sober seven years, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's a bit weird now. But uh, I understand. You know. Yeah, well, it's I've not been, just uh, it's not just the the booze and the drugs and the rock and roll and everything like that. It's also something like the sense of achievement and, um, and winning actually a victorious thing of all of the points of, um, you know, what? just putting on a gig, getting to a festival, getting to the end of the gig after you've been on a plane and all the things that can go wrong from there to that moment after the gig, where you have that sense of vindication and purpose and victory, to be honest, that having that completely absent from, um yeah your life is that's the i think that's the thing i found the most difficult i can i can i never had any money before so i can live without that and find a way to adapt to that but it's the other thing and it's yeah, not I mean, just okay. the, you know this is this is a sort of a dialogue i have with my mom oh uh, because i was never good at school i was never good at anything in school i struggled as a kid uh being with anxiety, with exams from the age of 10 to 15, 16. I was always the last guy in the exams. Uh, I couldn't do study home, doing homework. I just, I couldn't, I'm dyslexic, just fuck. Yeah, yeah. So I, hate, I hated being in school. I never got any sort of respect or self-respect out of being in school. I was never pleased with myself being in school. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't finish any fancy education. I'm not qualified to do fancy shit, except this one thing: being mm. in this band. Yeah, yeah. It's I've sort of been been with the guys in this band and sort of invested a lot of time in that, and <clears throat> and I've I've gotten uh, self-respect from it, and yeah, yeah. I get comp- I get compliments, and I live for that moment. Yeah, yeah. So. If there's anything I can say, oh, I'm pretty good at doing this, and I'm confident yeah. I, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's you know, that's how I feel. Yeah, as well. Yeah. I'm sort of I've I've, I've mastered this. It's uh, it's almost like you spent 18 years being a dental specialist, and then someone says, "Oh, we're gonna take the teeth out of everyone, and it's gonna have fake teeth." Yeah, yeah. And you're like, what am I gonna do then? That's a really strange analogy, but yeah, I understand completely. I, I, I agree with you. I, I was always in trouble in school, always um, being thrown out of school and a lot of pretty difficult time as well. I mean, I could do the work. That's no problem. It was uh, the academic stuff wasn't that much of a problem, but it was just everything that surrounded it. Um, and I, again, this it's not that your sense of entire sense of self-worth is wrapped up in this, but definitely it's I it's the it's the the purpose and focus and a place for your energy your agency in the world to go to do you know what i mean and uh, having literally none of that and if somebody said to me okay well next year doesn't look like you can do this either um 
it's going to be a really complicated place mentally to try and navigate the terrain of, oh, okay, so the 30-year structure you built around your life has now been uprooted. Uh, now, what do you want to do? You want to be a carpenter? I don't know. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm doing. So, you know. Yeah. But that's I, I, I know that's why I said it. <laughs> you <Yeah>. and Jesus. <laughs> exactly. You know. Uh, but then again, I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to focus on all the projects to do. I have, I have four albums coming out. Mm. So, and I have like three more that I want to want to do different stuff yeah but it's it's part it's, uh, being, it's being active in the human process as it's removed that's the that's the most difficult thing i find because we haven't been rehearsing yeah. even we can't even meet to rehearse or anything so i've had literally no ability to even play play with anybody else or anything you know yeah i, I know what you mean i mean we actually now when you bring it up we had a rehearsal the other day mm. and we were just rehearsing really old stuff so we're just having fun. It was, it was very nice going to the rehearsal space and just, hey man, I was like, oh, we hadn't met him in months. Yeah, yeah. So you, you t but it's always the same. You take shit for granted until you can't do them. Well, I, I, I feel that I took things for granted more 15, like 10 to 15 years ago than I did the last five or 10. As we got bigger and I got older and I started to, um, you know, drink and drug a bit less and enjoy the company of all the people around me more. And I, I didn't take any of it for granted. I, I Going to South America or Central America or Russia, I, I, I drank it all in and tried to kind of live every moment. Whereas when I was 28, it was like, blah, 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 you know, whatever, a bit more. And that's not going to sound good on a podcast. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I did take it for granted, but I just didn't expect it to just be moved no, so no, but now, now I'm saying you would even appreciate it more if, if, if Kieran would call you tomorrow, hey, lads, let's have a band rehearsal. Yeah, well. You would be like, oh, my God, we're we having a band rehearsal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really strange, you know. Um, w one thing I wanted to kind of talk to you about, if it's all right, is just that um, we talked about this a lot before because we went on some crazy tours years ago, you know. Mm. Um, it, just that, because you do this thing in the middle of a Solstafira show where you do this big speech about depression and all this kind of stuff, you know? And I just wanted to sort of pivot a little bit to um, that decision to go sober, you know? Because you're quite vocal and open about that. And people who don't even know you know that about you from saying it in interviews and that kind of stuff, you know? Like just that moment of clarity where you went, right, that's it, I've had enough. What was that like? Is that a weird question? Uh, no, no, I mean, you know, it's... Uh, you can just say uh, party if you want instead. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, <laughs> now, uh, yeah, but it's seven years ago now. I'm very open about it. I mean, you know, if uh, I have many, yeah, many friends that have sober, it, it's, it's weird because uh, sobriety is a very open thing in Iceland. Really? It's not a taboo. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it, it's a very, it's, for example, I have friends, friends in France. Okay. And I think they thought like, why the fuck would you quit drinking? Why yeah. the fuck would you uh, quit drinking? It's yeah, a very yeah. stupid. You went and went so, yeah. yeah, I mean, they just thought it was so weird. Uh, prior to me quitting drinking in 2013, I didn't know anyone that, I didn't uh, hang with people that didn't drink. Yeah, yeah. All, all of my friends used drugs and drank whiskey every day, yeah. including you. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was weird <laughs> because it was just, I shat myself, literally. I was, you know, being unfaithful to my girlfriend at the time. And I was just, you know, being uh, unfaithful and lying and not being, you know, just being an asshole. So in order to try to win her back, I would, you know, trying to prove something. Yeah. Uh, but something clicked. I just, I found out that I had had enough. Mm. Uh, I had had enough. I met people on the way that uh, I sort of thought, I like what you have. I, I like what you have. You have this c confidence. 
you don't look like you're 100 years old when you're only 35. <laughs> yeah, hey, are you slagging on Irish people? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and, yeah, and, yeah. and you, don't, you don't owe $800 to a drug dealer or yeah. you can actually pay your rent. You don't lie to your mom and dad. And, you know, it's, you, can, you have a car. I did, my car, I did throw it away. So tired of being depressed all the time, tired of never having money, tired of feeling like failure fucking all the time. Mm. So that's sort of, I know. I found, I saw something sexy in other people's eyes that had done the same thing. Yeah. And it's sort of, I don't know. It's like, it, it, yeah, it's uh, you. You, it becomes attractive, and mm. uh, uh, sooner uh, you, than you expect, you've been sober for three months, mm. and you said, "This is all right." And it's six months and a year, and now I've been sober. Uh, but then again, life does not stop. Yeah, I mean, you still have deaths in the family you can get married you can get divorced you can have a sick child you can lose your job yeah all that stuff happens i mean you can be fucking depressed but yeah. you should just go and fucking exercise and eat healthy right yeah don't tell me but so many of my friends they're struggling with depression <coughs> or, or or they pee themselves sometimes and i sort of just do the list here you're suicidal and sometimes you urinate yourself. You don't talk to your mom. You cannot talk to your kid. You lost your job. Your bandmates are giving up on you. Mm. <clears throat> and but but you're living the dream, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, yeah. But then again, let's you know, try to quit drinking for three months. For Christ's sake, stop eating hamburgers at all times. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I, mean, I, I sound like a boring cunt. No. No. But because. It, no, 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 but, but my point is, if sure. you are feeling suicidal, mm. maybe you should try some little bit different things. Yeah. But then again, now I'm just to, to go to the suicidal part, because so many people die from suicides. Mm. And it's so connected to addiction. Yeah. And de depression. Okay. It all holds, holds, holds in hands. People say... Oh, he didn't die from alcoholism. He died from depression. Well, alcoholics are fucking depressed. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, alcohol, alcohol is is uh, is a fertilizer for depression. That's a good phrase. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's like a gasoline nitroglycerin for depression. So, and if you kill yourself, you're just destroying the people around you. Mm, yeah. You're not, you're not. You're not. You're not setting yourself free. No, no, no. You're slaving all the people that love you. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this a lot before, is that it's also about where the line is. You know, we, we, where... Wait, 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 stop, dude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no. Once, once, a dra once a druggie, always. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, that's like, I always could see generally, okay, there's the line of where I'm having fun relatively in control of things and it, it, it ended up being a bit chaotic every now and again but generally the destruction and the complete messiness was not really what I was interested in but for sure I had many friends and do still have many many friends and you know that that's the, the I sprint, love that the sprint right when, to I, the when, end. Yeah, yeah. when I was chaos. 18 and it was yeah. carry, on, carry on no no it's 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 I think there's gradients on the scale you know but for sure do you think that the band could have continued if you didn't get sober? It's a good question. Uh, I think, we, no, I think we would have exploded. I mean. Yeah. Because you were touring so much and like yeah. bands tend to tour so much and you pour so much alcohol in it and so much, it can only end, I think, generally. I mean, I mean, I mean it's not just me. I mean, we were all drinking and doing drugs. Yeah. Uh, and at the time, you know, we're doing a month of touring in Europe, <clears throat> flying from Lisbon to New Jersey to do another tour in America. No yeah. one was talking, arguing. There's vodka bottles being thrown. Yeah, yeah. There's violence. And so, no, I, I, no, we would have quit. 
Yeah. That's 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 why we came to the conclusion that you know we had to let one member go because it it was the band was dying. Yeah. I mean, we had tried it for years. I mean, because you're a band, and now I'm just going into different things here. But you're a band. You think you can beat everything. Yeah. But it comes <clears> down to everybody hates each other's hates each other's neck. No one. Everybody comes home in debt. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, your management gives up on you. Label gives up on you. I mean, if you ask Michael, is the stuff that we put him through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> ask, ask Aaron the stuff we put her through. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah. this is just this ridiculous <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's... So, uh, the... Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I think we, we, we would have, I mean, I, we would have for sure broken up. I mean, yeah. Is there moments when you do miss the, the the slightly more chaotic live show, the buzz of playing with a you know a slightly buzzed brain, buzzed head? Is that the right word? No, I don't know. You I, know I don't. Who? No, no. I, I don't miss that at all. Mm. No, 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 no. I, I've gotten way more confidence now. Mm. Sweet. I, I can <laughs> tell you. You know, the, the the small truth here is that uh, let's just say touring off. 2014, I was very shy because I realized that I hadn't done a Soul Service show sober, never. Mm. I mean, not as a touring band, you know, the touring band the last 10 years. <clears throat> um, so I was very shy because, I mean, we, we even had these rituals, me and Shrava. I mean, we would, I would pass him the Jim Beam bottle and, um, uh, he would drink, you know, stage, and we would normally finish a bottle of Jim Beam together on stage. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so that sort of was, was also kind of weird. Um, but yeah, I was very shy, so I, th I told myself, "I'm just going to pretend that I'm Nick Cave." Okay. Because Nick Cave is the coolest cat out there. Yeah. Uh, he he quit drugs. If he can do this, I can do this. Yeah. So I just thought I'm not gonna be the shy kid, you know, that I I can be. Yeah. I'm just gonna be Nick Cave. Yeah. So, and then sort of a few months later, six months later, whatever, I didn't have to pretend I was Nick Cave anymore. I could just be me. I was sort of. I would get more eye contact with people. Mm. I, I was I wasn't falling on my ass. I was, I was you know if someone was crying, I would notice. I would go yeah. hug the person. I would go straight after the gig. Uh, I would have patience to <coughs> sign, uh, sign everything, to take photos. Otherwise, I'd be just be doing lines with you in the backstage room and drinking a beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that's yeah, the I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you can. I, I think you can do both, but I do know what you mean. You know, it's definitely there's been a, a lot more gigs in the last five or ten years that I've been stone cold sober, and what I find out actually is that it makes me. Um, especially when I went from heavy booze into just drinking wine, it almost made me too jovial, too nice. I found that s s sober and very straight when I Alan, played. Alan, 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 you're never too nice. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Well, that's sweet. That's what. I'll, that's the only. That's the sound bite for the that I wanted. Um, but, but I. Okay, but <laughs> let, let me some. You know. Okay, carry on. Sorry. No, I was able to channel into a lot more anger and aggression by being straight and i thought i would thought to myself oh this is way better than being um than having be uh, being sort of having my sharp edges sort of slightly rounded yeah. by half a bottle of wine but i still that's the thing i think that the difference for me is that moving that when i stopped drinking really heavy booze and just started to but, drink but, wine. but don't you think don't you think it has changed today if i go to a gig mm. Uh, and I see a <clears throat> member in the band, hammered drunk. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I think, what the fuck? Are you fucking hammered drunk? Yeah. I want my money back, bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I when agree. I was 20, when I was 20, uh, I don't, not, now I don't know if this is the sobriety thing or not. When I was 20, I would go to the local gig, and the drummer would be hammered. I would be like, fuck yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I would tell... I would go tell all my, tell all my mates, hey man, the drummer was so drunk, he yeah. fell on the bass drum, he puked all over himself, yeah, and yeah. then he passed up, passed out on the right symbol. Sure. I would tell all my friends. Today yeah. it would be like, 
the guitar the guitar player fucked up the second solo as well left sure well i mean there is a there is there is a line between being a complete mess and you know be, be drinking a you know a glass of wine or something on stage or having a beer on stage but i i i know what you mean yeah you're definitely your Hmm. I mean, the things I did when I was 25 or 26, definitely, I'm glad I phased them out around the late 2000s, generally. But there's still been a few in, few little moments here and there, of course. But you know. Who do you think is the coolest frontman out there today? Um, don't say fucking Don Duckin, all right? <laughs> Not anymore. I don't know, really. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, seeing as you put the name in my head, it would be hard to say somebody is better than Nick Cave, I suppose, you know. Uh, I, I, I know, Dave Gann from Depeche Mode, maybe, is one of the best, I think. Pro probably a guy that hasn't touched drugs in 30 years, dude. Yeah, probably, yeah. But, Dave uh, Gann is good, yeah. I mean, I look at guys like Hetfield. Okay. And I'm like, <clears throat> you, you mean, you're still doing that? Cool as fuck. And yeah. But he's, yeah, but he's fallen, he seems to have fallen off the wagon for the last couple of years, you know? Yeah, sure, that's what alcoholics do, mate. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. So do you, do you actually feel it like as if it's a, a counter, like a clock that you go, okay, another eight years, another seven and a half years, you, you do, like, do you think about it often that, okay, that's another month, another six months, or, you know? Never, no, 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 never, 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 never. I don't know, never like that. It just, uh, we joke about it all the time that, you know, middle aged. The only, the only difference thing is that after the gig, mm. I go. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not talking about after I've taken photos and all the stuff that you do after <coughs> tours. Yeah. I go to the hotel, eat some chocolate, watch Netflix, and yeah. I go to bed. Yeah, yeah. And, Sometimes I can go to the gym in the morning in the hotel. Yeah. But a few years ago, I never saw my hotel room because I would yeah. still be awake when yeah. it was bus call. I know what you mean, yeah. But Yeah, and then you, then you do the airport thing, pass mm. out on the floor in a pizza place at the airport. <laughs> and Or you pass out when you come home to your girlfriend. So it's, that's the only difference. Rest is the same. I think that... Um... You always said something to me, which is that you have to go from being a nighttime person to a morning person to make this work properly. And that always kind of stuck in my head, like, yeah, that makes sense. That you have to find the same joy of getting up at nine or 10 in the morning to go, whether it's running or playing football or whatever it is you're doing in the morning, as you get out of three and four and 5 a.m. when you're having, you know, the glass of whiskey and a good chat with somebody in a bar and all that kind of stuff. And I, I kind of thought to myself, I thought about that a lot and I thought, I'm still a nighttime person. I'm, I, I'm my, you know, my internal clock is still to be blah, 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 and chatting and up for good debates and chats at three and four in the morning. I, I, I'm still not able to, I think, um, turn my body clock upside down, you know, but that's, that's something you said always stuck with me. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Totally. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, people are different. Uh, <clears throat> I think, I think, you know, this is not a children's material, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, I, that means, for example, the difference is when we were touring, uh, you would go to bed. Yeah. Five, maybe, 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 maybe at five, six in the morning. Sure. Yeah. I will still be finishing off your drugs at nine in the morning. <laughs> yeah. And then having to play so then, four hours later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that was the worst. That was this is Stuttgart. We were doing the corporate planning tour. Yeah. I remember waking up at two or three after one hour of sleep. Or, I mean, that's for example, I felt like such an ass, <clears throat> and you know, disappointing. I mean, I fucked up the gig. I fucked everything up. Everybody, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's deep. not. A, uh, yeah, exactly. And one another another thing I have to say is that when we were starting touring, I mean, I would do a bottle of whiskey a, a night. Yeah, same. Yeah. You know, ten twenty beers and chain smoke, lucky strike, and hardly sleep anything at night. And I was always complaining about my voice. Yeah, yeah, of course. Why yeah. my voice? Yeah, yeah. And then, then of course, 
<laughs> it, it, was ne- it was never the booze or the cigarettes. No. It was just something else. I uh, mean, I, 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 I would change from Lucky Strike into Camel or yeah, Camel yeah. the Marlboro or change yeah, it to Jim Beam or Jack or something. Oh, you didn't bring your lucky yeah. pillow or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It must be the pillow. Yeah, and not the fact but that I was then, up at five in the morning going back in black. I hit the sack. No, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So then, I mean, these times, <clears throat> we are touring, <clears throat> we are doing maybe two hours a night. Yeah, sure. And I can sing two hours a night without struggling. Yeah. And maybe for 30 days in a row. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that I find myself really good about myself, being able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult as you get older. I mean, I've always, the thi- I think the thing for me is that I've always been into sport and always played football and ran and I was never in sports <clears throat> yeah so I was always quite fit in that sort of sense that I could um take maybe a bit more punishment um physically and I always was like the kind of li- person at 6am who was still like oh yeah I don't know relatively relatively um no, I'm not gonna use the word straight but I wouldn't be a mess and then I could still sing the next day and Generally, I got away with it for the last couple of years, but definitely as we get older, I found like, oh, you need to get some sleep. You need to try and behave a little yeah. bit better, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, yeah, those days are over for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> uh, do, you know. do you, uh, uh, I was just about to remind you of a ridiculous thing from, what was the festival? Summer Breeze Festival. Summer Breeze Festival. Yeah, do you know? Yeah, what about that one? Wandering around in a crowd of 40,000 people taking mushrooms. Do you not remember that? Or should I be mentioning what? that in the podcast? Yeah. I don't remember that. Uh, no? In a little vacuum packed bag, me, you, and Yarko from, or Yanni from Corporate Clanny. That was. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I, I don't should, remember that. Maybe I should cut that out of the podcast. No, no, I don't. I, I, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you, you no, had them in a little vacuum. We had them in a little vacuum packed bag. Remember, we terrorized Michael for hours and hours and hours and hours. Are you sure I was with you? Or? Yeah, it was you. Of course, it was you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but no. The, the the biggest beauty and sort of salvation about quitting doing drugs. I can talk about stuff I did. I'm not hiding anything. Sure. I'm not. You know, when I was. <clears throat> Doing them, I couldn't tell you because I was hiding it. Sure, I'm yeah. not hiding it now. I, I don't give a shit. Yeah, that's an interesting. I talk about I talk about drugs all the time. Yeah, I think it's funny. It's it, it's funny and not because it kills a lot of people and it makes a lot of people feel very bad. Yeah, but then again, I have humor for it. So uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I could just I can I can pull up this key here and you'll probably laugh. <laughs> yeah. see it's, it's a joke yeah, yeah yeah well is there any point is there any point in um should i ask you then do you think that being sober changed the tone of the music do you think that maybe the music became more sober as you once this, you this is a this is a really good question uh i think it did but not, i want your opinion you did okay yeah okay okay uh I thought when Trent Reznor got sober, it changed the way Nine Inch Nails sounded. Okay, interesting. That's that. Yeah, that was what what I thought because <laughs> it did the down the, the downward spiral was like Trent doing drugs and I was I would, I would say like oh, he, he sold out or he wimped out when he got sober. Sure, I, I would probably be the guy that said that. Uh, it's very weird for me to answer this, but uh, I don't think it did. Uh, if it did, then how? Um, is it less gain on the guitars? Are the songs more happy? Are they shorter? Are they slower? Are there more violins? Are there less violins? Because it's still four guys playing on heavy metal guitars. Sure, of distortion, course. Distortion. Yeah. Violence, 10, 15 minute songs, depression stuff about wanting to kill yourself or not kill yourself. Yeah. To me, it was just oh, a little bit less reckless, a tiny bit less reckless. 
A little. But then again, th yeah, maybe but that's, then but again, that's what it sounds like to me, maybe. Are you talking about only the last album? No, the last maybe three, maybe. I, I know, well, like, well, that, yeah. Two, two specifically, but um, let's say it just felt to me like maybe it's a natural progression. Maybe it's the natural progression as a musician, or maybe is there, I, what I wanted to ask you was, there, was there some element of it that is down to uh, sobriety that it, it, it seemed to move a, 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 in, a, in a certain direction that was a little bit less uh, the kind of crazy, reckless soul stuff? Sure, sure. But, you know, <clears throat> it's, a good, it's a good topic because let's just stick with Swartasanta. When we do okay. Swartasanta, yeah. we're, I mean, all, we're all drinking. record, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're all drinking and doing drugs in the studio could me even beat up the producer <laughs> yeah, yeah. while recording the album. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he came through that door. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> in, in this apartment and beat, I was gonna beat the producer to death in my yeah. bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> so that was how we did Sartre Santa, full blown alcoholic craziness. Yeah, yeah. So then <laughs> we do, then we do, uh, Ota in 2013. Mm. That's sort of me getting sober. So the album is not written with anything to do with sobriety. It's written everybody drinking and doing whatever. Mm. So you, you cannot say that me getting sober in 2013 changed Ota because okay. it, yeah. it happened basically afterwards. That only leaves one album after that. So and that would be Bertram. But then again, Bertram is such a weird album in that context because we have a new drummer. Mm. We have a new uh, sort of band chemistry. Sure, yeah. We had, we had, a, we had a 20 year old chemistry leading up to Ota. Mm. And you know, band chemistry is yeah. it's, it's, it's magic that you can't touch. Yeah, yeah. But sure, so sure. Even, even, even if you just change a quarter from the chemistry, it's not going to be the same chemistry. Yeah, so yeah. we had a dif different chemistry uh, for sure. And we had a different producer. We had, you know, those different vibes. Mm. Mm. Listen, well, since we're friends, you can tell me, listen to the new one, new one. Yeah. <clears throat> and tell me, tell, tell me, is it, tell me, uh, it's, it's a fucking sober album. It sucks. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, di I didn't mean, I meant it more like the, maybe it was also the live shows as well. Maybe it was just that there was a certain recklessness that I identified with. Sure, sure. That, that, that was the, in primordial the, the, the as live well. Show. Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> but, but then again, then again, I remember when we sort of entered the States, I mean, the first time we met, we was the Hole in the Sky, mm. 2013. Or before. I remember we, Before, I think, actually. 2010, <clears throat> 10, yeah. 11, 10, 11, 10, yeah. 11, 10, 11, because we met Michael there for the first time. Yeah. I remember we were sort of kind of hip band. Uh, people thought we were <clears throat> exciting. Young yeah, yeah. band from Iceland. Exotic. And, I mean, <laughs> exotic band. We, we drank more than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. We were sort of someone new to the, I mean, you had been doing this for years before. So we would have a party in, in a hotel room in Bergen. And we would have Gorkorov, Wardruna, Vatain, Primordial, so many bands packed in one fucking room. Yeah, yeah. I was <clears throat> the first one to pass out there. Marianne, <laughs> there's, there's even two people dead from that party. Yeah. Uh, our friend from Devil's Blood and Marianne, they're both gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, let's not go into that. But so we, we were sort of very reckless there. So yeah. if you take <clears throat> that version of the band compared to today, yeah, I will, I will agree with you. That reckless thing you're talking about, mm. reckless thing, yeah. it's, it's not really there. Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's not really there. No, no. But maybe it, <laughs> had to, it had to be like this so you can divide the uh, story up into chapters. That's what I try and do. I was talking today about albums from 20 years ago and I was thinking, oh, this is like the second chapter of the band. Then there's the third and the fourth and the fifth. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah. I guess that's what made me a bit sad because then I was going, oh, maybe we just had the last chapter and I didn't know about it. 
Uh, sure, sure, but you know, <clears throat> I, I guess yeah, we nice. were almost like we were almost like Metallica with Dame Stain back then. <laughs> sort of. But don't start. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, no, I mean, just wild <laughs> shit. Yeah. We were a band again. I mean, Dame Stain was beat was would beat up the guy from Armored Saint for yeah. saying a bad thing to Lars. I mean, we were yeah. sort of we were, we were a gang. Yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, check out the last Megadeth album. I mean, I'm not a Megadeth fan, but. It's not really the same Dame Stain. No, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, don't, I have no idea why I'm talking about Dame Stain. I'm not no, a I'm Metallica fan, so. Yeah, yeah, I know that we've been through this a hundred times, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I know what you mean, like, you have to do, it's good, it, it's a good kind of like, you can bookend the story with different chapters when you've had a very long career. And what I was trying to sort of understand was that the sort of new version of the band owes, maybe owes, what does it owe to the change in the lifestyle and the sobriety and the change of mental attitude and health and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I was trying to think about because you've always been very open about talking about it. And, that, and that's something that um, I think a lot of musicians are, don't do enough and are very, um, they kind of maybe think it's sort of weak or something like this to, to, to discuss mental health issues. And I think that that's really negative. Of course. It's really it's negative. A mat, it's a <laughs> material thing. I mean, man, Men are tough, like Steve Hughes, man. Just listen to Steve Hughes. Men are tough. They don't cry. They yell. They have bad temper. They will knock the shit out of you if you say something wrong. It's just stupid, man. It's mm. just, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, it's wrong. Men are supposed to be able to cry just as women. Do you know what's the, uh, who is the, uh, has the highest rating of killing themselves? It's young men. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's man can, man can, man cannot cry. <laughs> man cannot have feelings. Man cannot be gay. All this stuff you teach people that man cannot be this or this because you have, you have to be tough. Mm. But I don't think society is the same way anymore as it used to be in the nineteen seventies or fifties. I think that there is. I think that there is a greater understanding of all the things you're saying in a broader society. But still, I find that it's not that I find metal or most heavy metal still macho. I don't really find that so much anymore, but I definitely do think that there is an unwillingness to discuss mental health. And I don't think they're the yeah. same thing. I don't meet that many, you know, kind of macho, uh, whatever, even in black metal scene or something, not quite the same thing anymore. I mean, and I don't think there's the same, um, like if you talk to, you know, to Christian, to Gal about when he came out, and the, uh, the impression is people had from the outside, like, oh, the me black metal scene must have been against you. And you see, he's just like, no, not really. No, no one cares. I'm not, but I'm but, not really talking about the, the black know. metal scene. I know, I know that, you know, you know. I know, but what I'm trying to get at is that I think that, I think that society has changed, but for some reason, musicians and their mental health um, is a really, is something that people don't really talk about very much, considering that they yeah, generally but, uh, live, but, live less and, you know, the drinking yeah, and the drugs sure, and the but, but, but I'm just, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not just talking about that. I mean, uh, but if people want to talk about, hey man, I don't feel good. Mm. I've I've been wanting to kill myself for the last seven years. <clears throat> mm. I've been self-medicating with drugs because I always want to kill myself. Yeah, it's a taboo. People don't talk about that. Yeah, it's true. So, uh, and and you're not weak if you say that. No, no. Uh, you would I would say you're strong if you say that. Mm. it takes a lot of courage strength because you will always be paranoid filled with anxiety that people would judge you do you think you, it's something that do you think it's something that we talked about more in our 20s that we don't talk about anymore in your mid 40s because you're not supposed to or i find that i had conversations more about that maybe when i was in my 20s than now it's a long time since anybody asked me that you know or is that because life changes and you have different um, things occupying that place in your life or something, you know? I just, I just, <clears throat> the people I meet in daily, daily life are just people that are very open about things and things mm. like this. Do you think that's an Icelandic it, trait? Yeah, it, even the guys in the band, I mean, the guys who've been banned have been to therapists and shrinks and psychiatrists <clears throat> and, you know, rehabs and we all, Everybody in the band is taking some antidepressants or anti-anxiety tablets. We've all done it's very open here. Do you think that that's an Icelandic thing, an Icelandic trait? It's not an Irish uh, trait. 
No, I, you're right. It's probably more <coughs> an, an athletic thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I guess so. I guess so. It's now it's for sure. I, I can't, I, I have some Irish fans. I can't really see them talk about this. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah they, 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 even the sentence here, like, yeah, I don't drink, is like, oh, what the fuck? You know, uh, it's Irish society is not, I don't think Irish society is macho, but I definitely think it's kind of tough. The people are quite tough. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, but, think yeah, but, don't, but don't get me, yeah, that's maybe the different word I'm saying. Tough is maybe a better word. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but um, not, not necessarily macho, but very tough. I mean, but then again, it's not really tough feeling depressed all the time or no but or... no but I, I i'm just wondering about the suicidal thing because i i just wonder do some certain countries have more of an urge for that i don't know it's i'd have to look at i i certainly can see that the statistics of it because we used to play this game you know in the back of the tour bus the um the wikipedia where you pick the 20 the top 20 whatever and then you would have placed bets on it we used to do it with twilight of the gods all the time top 20 most populous cities top 20 biggest bridges in whatever country and the top 20 suicides were always belarus lithuania russia always former eastern Bloc, cold northern countries but uh you know iceland did pretty good ireland did pretty good as well actually we were we would have been up there for, it's always you know, it's always it's always always been this most East, eastern blocks uh, ireland uh, and it's always been uh, greenland so there, ain't, there ain't many suicide stats from costa rica that's for sure no, you know, but it's, <laughs> anywhere uh, where the sun shines, yeah, yeah. No, I guess it's you know, but Iceland has had uh, a lot of it now. But then you know, we've had uh, lots of uh, sort of opioid crisis doing drugs, and it just drains everything. Every every every, jo every joy station the brain produces it just vacuums them. Why do you, why do, why is there such an opioid crisis? Because I, I watched that documentary I told you about on Netflix about the three murders you had in the early eighties. Um, and they don't seem to have much of a crime rate, but, but, but as you said, sort of like an opioid is like a pill crisis. Is that because yeah, American, uh, is because uh, Reykjavik is used as a transporting airport across the I, state? Or? Iceland is the funny thing when it comes to this drug <laughs> thing, because we never had a heroin epidemic. Mm. I mean, you can yeah, go we did to, in the 80s and 90s, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Ireland did, England did, Sweden and Norway did, Denmark did, all the countries around us did. Mm. We never had a heroin epidemic. All the other drugs came here in the 1980s, and 80s, of course. But we never did. Uh, it isn't until now that there's an epidemic with fentanyl, fentanyl oxy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fentanyl, the fentanyl is killing youth people fentanyl killing the yeah yeah it's uh the heart stops and the lungs collapse and all this yeah. stuff and <clears throat> so yeah that's uh there was on the paper today that we are the the are the uh, northern european champions if young people dying from fentanyl really mm -hmm. yeah well it's oh the so i mean i mean i mean the suicide as well because mm. I mean, yeah, so it's either either your heart stops or your joy your or your head tells you that you have to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's kind of but, fucked up. But one thing I always like, whenever the time I've been up in Iceland, it always struck me that um once I've been to Iceland, then I I felt I really understood the sound of Salstafir. Like it sounded like it sounds like you are from where you're from once you've been there. Does that make any sense? Like not just the sure. nature, but not just the nature, but the people and their sense of humor, their sense of directness. Sure, sure. I mean, I agree with this. Uh, we've probably spoken about this. Uh, primordial don't sound like they're from Russia. They don't mm. sound like they're from China. It don't sound like American <clears throat> band. The Beatles that didn't sound like they were Italian. Uh, Siguros don't sound like they're from Spain. Mm. Black, Black Sabbath don't sound like, you know, mm. you could go this for a long time. Maybe we do, but it's it's very hard to explain. Uh, the more you explain it, the weirder the answer gets. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a bit like it. Iceland, though. <laughs> this is Iceland yeah, society, it, you know? It's weird. I mean, 
<clears throat> but I, th I, I think the big thing is something with the mental stuff is that um, I think it comes something from the 80s because bands didn't come here in the 80s. Mm. And there was a lot of bands, uh, sort of indie bands, the punk bands, shoegaze, uh, not shoegaze, but um, sort of, uh, no, but she, like Sugar Cubes. Sugar Cubes was a mixture of two older bands sort of weird punk bands. They were sort of inbreed influenced. There wasn't just the Sex Pistols or Ramones. There were just a lot of weird bands. Mm. And they would be influenced by each other and so more weird bands came. I mean, Shiguros was a weird band when they came out. Really yeah. weird band. Yeah, it's still a weird band, yeah. Björk is still a, re a weirdo. She's the weirdo of the weirdos, you know. Yeah. Uh, we were considered a really weird band when we came out. Mm. and some people think we're still weirdos <laughs> so yeah. exotic but that's a better word it's exotic sure uh, I don't people always ask I mean they probably ask you as well so how do you get us to be a successful band and I'm like okay what kind of music do you play oh we play death metal I'm like oh that's a bit tough isn't it <laughs> yeah I mean I love death metal but what are you going to do? Are you going to play faster than this drummer? Or are you going to tune more down? Yeah. You have to make something weird. Just make yeah, something I, weird. I, I think that that's something interesting is that when, when something feels uh, culturally aligned with the country that it's from and the lyrics aren't like nonsense or fantasy or, you know, there seems to be some form of simple spiritual connection people make to the music that is something that people who play in bands like, I don't know, the Black Dahlia Murder or something, will never really experience because ultimately it's escapism, it's fantasy, lyrically, so mostly. Um, sorry, Trevor. Um, but you, when you play in a band such as Primordial or Souls to Fear, you think you get, you get lucky with the transferal of what people uh, project onto you, in a sense, you know what I mean? Like this, this extra meaning, this extra... Yeah, but then again, then again, Does that make pe any people sense? don't, people don't understand our lyrics. No, well that's yeah, okay. So, but that's even more chapter. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because, but your I boat, always your, said your this. boat is even further out from the shore than ours. Yeah, I mean, I said you know, even though you don't understand the language, you understand the music. So, uh, yeah. So you know, it's a uh, it's a bit different. I mean, then again. It is kind of interesting that not many bands uh, that are non-English speaking bands, Rammstein, it's, it's a miracle. <clears throat> Rammstein is a fucking miracle. Is uh, it though? Because... Don't you think that Rammstein you can trace back to um, what you call a craft work? You can trace the... Yeah, but still, I mean, Rammstein I've is a about band. five times so far. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah, but the, the, a German <clears throat> singing band, heavy metal band, they're heavy metal band. Mm. Uh, f filling up Madison Square Garden. Yeah, you don't think that's outrageous? I suppose if you make your show, your stage show so incredibly outrageous, they've out, they've they've outdone Kiss. They're, they're out, they're times twenty, times fifty, even. Yeah, so you know, so yeah. you know, oh, yeah, we are we are we are a German metal band. We are gonna be bigger than Kiss in America. Yeah, we will have much and, and party. They, yeah, <laughs> and they did. So you know. Yeah. I mean, Seguros, for Seguros, for example, which I think is one of the best bands in the universe, mm. uh, they <clears throat> used Icelandic for the first albums, and then they just used bullshit. Yeah. Make you up stuff, yeah. Yeah, just bullshit. It's just like, you know, oh, if we demo the album, we just cannot write lyrics. Yeah. And so... It's, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, no, no English lyrics for you on this new album? There's one. One. Okay. I can tell you a secret then. Now the album has an English title. <laughs> yeah. Speak Irish or die. Okay, sweet. <laughs> It'll go down very well uh, with a very small portion of Irish society these days. Yeah. Uh, no, it's one one English song and uh, one Greek title. Greek title. Yeah. All right. So, so, you know, most of the album is in Icelandic. All right. 
Yeah, I always wondered about, wondered about that because I like the English, I like to have English, well, I really sing in English, of course, but I like it, the rabble-rousing nature of a, a big chorus that people can penetrate, you know. I still think you should do an album in Irish Irish. You think so? Album. With, a, with, yeah. my, with my broad, uh, posh accent. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Let Simon sing. Well, um, no, I'm pretty sure that Paul can uh, write the lyrics for you. Okay. Um, so listen, I've got one more thing to show you, and this is going to be yeah. the end of the interview. Are you ready? Yeah. This isn't, this isn't going to be good on a podcast, but... <clears throat> This better be good, man. Pretty good. Are you ready? What is it? Oh, uh, a Phenom. <laughs> What's the name of the band? Phenom. Say it again. It's an F. No. Phenom. <laughs> like fentanyl. Venom. No. Venom. Venom vinyl. Yeah. Venom in it. Venom vinyl. Venom yeah. vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right. what guitar is that? What guitar is that back there? Oh, hang on. I'll press, 